It's time to talk about June's Journey, a hidden object mystery game with a captivating detective story. When you're playing, you solve a mind-teasing mystery of the roaring 1920s while you dive into June's captivating quest to uncover a scandalous family secret and solve her sister's murder. It's mystery, it's danger, and it's romance, and you never know where the next chapter's gonna take you. If that wasn't fun enough, you get to customize your very own luxurious island estate. Seriously, I cannot stop playing. I am already on the third chapter, and I just started recently. Join me back in time in the glamorous 1920s. June needs your help, detective. Download June's Journey for free today on iOS and Android. Patrons heard this episode first. You can be a patron too by hitting the link in our show notes or visiting patreon.com slash the murder diaries pod. One of the perks our patrons get is a shout out on an episode. Thanks so much, Alexis. Welcome back to another episode of The Murder Diaries. I'm Paige. And I'm Natalie. In 2002, 19-year-old Rachel Cook was visiting home in Georgetown, Texas. She was visiting from college in San Diego for the winter break. On the morning of January 10th, she left her parents' house for a run. She never returned. In the 23 years since Rachel went missing, the family, community, and investigators have been tormented at the lack of answers and the empty place in their lives Rachel once filled. This is her story. You still think it's in my head, but I'm walking with the dead. Rachel Louise Cook was born May 10th, 1982, to software engineer Robert and Janet, a high school teacher. She was raised in Georgetown, Texas, with her younger sister, Joanne. Georgetown is a quaint suburb that sits just 30 miles, 48 kilometers north of Austin. It's also the county seat of Williamson County, Texas. Rachel was very into fashion from a young age, extending that love at 18 years old to the Miss Georgetown pageant. It's here that she also extended her singing talent. While she didn't win, Rachel was happy to have just taken part in the experience. Rachel was beautiful and loved life. Her friend Shannon says she was just one of those people that you wanted to be around all the time. Her father recalls that Rachel never could get enough done in a day. A love of running found Rachel early on in elementary school. She excelled at the sport, outperforming peers across gender groups. In high school, she continued with long-distance track and cross-country running. Another love in Rachel's life was her boyfriend, Greg. She brought home her new boyfriend that winter break to meet her family. Greg met the family and returned to California before the new year. Rachel was smitten, telling her friend Shannon that she was in love and happier than ever. Shannon tells Disappeared that the pair seemed to get along really well. Her mom, Janet, says that the new boyfriend was a super guy, super attentive to her, sympathetic to her desires about her future, her dreams. Sister Joanne says that Rachel really thought he might be the one. Continuing to enjoy the winter break after Greg had left, January 10th, 2002 began like any other Thursday for the Cook family. Rachel was still home from college in San Diego, where she was attending San Diego Mesa College. On top of that, she was set to attend her cousin's wedding in Texas before returning to San Diego. By all means, the family was enjoying their time together. Rachel, ever the fashionista, asked pretty much everyone in her family for guidance on what she might wear to the wedding. I'm not quite sure she was pleased with anything she brought because she and her dad made plans for that afternoon to go shopping for the wedding. However, that morning, Rachel was still asleep on the couch while the rest of the family was busy with the typical weekday routines. They were eating breakfast together and all of them were gone by about 8 a.m. off to school and work. It wasn't until 9.15 that Rachel woke up from a cell phone call from Greg, the new boyfriend. Again, he was back in San Diego at this point. She told him that she was getting up to go for a run, which was a daily practice for Rachel. She was known to run about four to six miles, six and a half to nine and a half kilometers every day. The phone call ended with, I miss you, I'll call you later. Investigators believe Rachel would have left the family home around 930 for her run. The Georgetown suburb Rachel grew up in was classic Texas with sprawling lots set back from the road and wide open spaces. Rachel loved it and she knew it well. Her running route that day was not new to her in the slightest. In fact, she even saw old neighbors that she knew well as she was out on her run, waving to them and exchanging pleasantries. But it wasn't until 3 p.m. that anybody noticed Rachel didn't make it home. Her father returned from work around that time and noticed that Rachel wasn't home as expected. This was odd because they planned to go shopping that afternoon. Moreover, her purse and cell phone were left at home. He quickly checked in with her friend Shannon to see if she was with her or if 
Shannon had heard from her. Shannon says, no, she hadn't, but that the two did have plans to go out together later that night. In fact, Shannon was shocked to hear from him that Rachel was gone and that her purse and cell phone were left at home. She says, quote, everybody that knew Rachel knew she didn't go anywhere without her personal belongings. Right then when he told me that, I started to get really worried. The next contact the family made was to Wildfire, a restaurant where Rachel would pick up ships sometimes for extra money when she was in town. They called and asked if Rachel was working, and the answer was a relieving yes. The family figured she must have just gotten a ride to the restaurant for a shift and accidentally left her purse and cell phone behind, as well as forgot to leave a note or something to let them know she picked up a shift. That relief didn't last long, though. The family's fears returned in the morning when Rachel still hadn't come home. They called the restaurant again to inquire further about Rachel, and they discovered that there had been a miscommunication. There was a Rachel working that night, but it wasn't Rachel Cook. When the family called to ask, is Rachel working? The person on the other end said yes, and technically that was correct. It just wasn't there, Rachel. With this turn of events, the family starts checking Rachel's belongings. They realize that of her extensive clothing collection that she had brought home with her, the only pieces that were missing were a green sports bra, a gray running sweatsuit, and Asics running shoes. Along with those articles of clothing, her yellow Walkman was also missing. All of this went back to the initial fear that Rachel went for a run and never came home. Her dad headed out and drove along her running route while Janet checked the local hospital. Neither, unfortunately, were able to find out anything pointing them towards Rachel. And with that, the pair headed to the sheriff's office to report her missing around 2 p.m. January 11th. Detective Hawkins says that, to their knowledge, there had never been a case like this, a young hometown girl just vanishing without a trace. For that reason, the family explains that they recall the sheriff's office was quick to say that she was most likely off with her boyfriend in Mexico or someplace partying and that she would turn up soon. The family really felt like it wasn't being taken seriously in those extremely crucial first moments. They took matters into their own hands and organized a local search for Saturday, January 12th. The investigators showed up to the search around noon that Saturday and stopped it. One of the concerns investigators had was that this large group of people was walking all over what could have been a potential crime scene. The investigators may have stopped that search, but they brought in a Texas Ranger the next day to assist. With that, the family began to be more at ease with the investigative efforts, especially when the Ranger let them know that he fully believed Rachel did not leave on her own accord, as the sheriff's office had first believed. That same day, Sunday, January 13th, an official search was underway. All the resources were deployed, ATVs, horseback, helicopters. They even brought in a Texas-based nonprofit, EquiSearch, to assist in the search for Rachel. Unfortunately, all of this was to no avail. On top of that, detectives were also working on a timeline of Rachel's final moments before her disappearance. It was a bit of a struggle, but they knew that her mother and sister had last seen her at 8 a.m. that Thursday morning. Her cell phone records also indicated that the last phone call was that call with her boyfriend, Greg, that I referenced earlier. These records also confirmed that he was in California at the time of the call. A few people that lived in the neighborhood were also able to confirm that they saw her running that morning. Around 10 a.m., she passed a neighbor couple as they were out for their daily walk. They saw her again 20 minutes later as she passed them again. Another set of neighbors, a woman and her daughter, also confirmed seeing Rachel at the end of their cul-de-sac as they were in their front yard. Rachel had stopped there for a quick stretch during the run. She waved and exchanged a quick neighborly chat with the pair before heading back out to finish her run. The final sighting of Rachel was at 10.45 from a neighbor as they pulled out of their driveway. Rachel had ran behind their car as they were getting ready to pull out. This house was about 20 yards from Rachel's parents' house. The neighbors, in fact, thought that with the direction she was headed, that it looked like she was done with her run and going home. There is no evidence that Rachel made it home. Thus, investigators believe that she was abducted during that jog. Despite that determination, there was unfortunately barely anything to help lead investigators to her or what happened to her. As the detective puts it, quote, we have absolutely no evidence of a crime scene at all. There's no evidence in the road. There's no evidence in the house. There's no evidence anywhere that anything even happened to her. The official search through the sheriff's office was eventually called off, but the search organized by Rachel's parents continued for weeks. EquiSearch continued their efforts as well. So many people had come together for Rachel. It was an extremely emotional time for the whole community. Media coverage picked up and tips started pouring into the sheriff's office. Detective Hawkins says he's interviewed in the triple digits in regards to people that were possible suspects or witnesses. 
many of the leads that came through were about a suspicious car that was in the neighborhood the day that Rachel went missing. It was described as a white Camaro or Pontiac Trans Am. Two young men were seen inside the vehicle. The sheriff's office literally lost count of how many leads involved this white car. The reason it was so suspicious to neighbors and investigators is that it was circling the neighborhood. And moreover, there was a report that a woman near Rachel's age was seen near it. One of those leads specifically claimed that they saw a woman struggling inside the car. That lead came to a dead end, though. The white Pontiac Trans Am was identified, and it ended up being two teenagers inside that were skipping school. There was no evidence of Rachel in the vehicle. Luckily, the Pontiac wasn't the only car investigators were interested in. A report of vehicles that were stolen and submerged in a local lake brought investigative dive teams out to Lake Georgetown. This lake is just a few miles from Rachel's parents' home. They hoped that if they recovered these vehicles, they could perhaps discover a link to Rachel's disappearance. It's not known how many of these cars were in question or recovered, but once they were recovered, it was discovered that the cars had been stolen before Rachel's disappearance, and they weren't able to link them to her in any way. A few sketches were also drawn of suspicious males that were in the area at the time of Rachel's disappearance, but no decent leads came of them. Of course, the investigators weren't just looking for strangers. They looked into those close to Rachel. They started with her boyfriend, Greg. Greg flew back to Texas that Sunday, the 13th, after Rachel had gone missing. He was questioned while he was in town, and I want to note and remind listeners that the phone records proved that Greg was in California during their last phone call that morning. Investigators, of course, were going to leave no stone unturned, and Greg consented and passed a polygraph test. Her parents did as well. Well, her mom did. Her father, he failed one question. Do you know where Rachel is? He answered, no. In his own words, quote, they asked me if I knew where Rachel was. I said, no. And unfortunately, I think, I think I do. I think she's in heaven. So I think that's why I didn't pass that one question. Her dad was ultimately cleared of any suspicion. One of Rachel's ex-boyfriends, Thomas, also became a person of interest when they were ruling those close to her out. Her sister, Joanne, had led investigators to know to look into him. While she was home that winter break, Rachel had told Joanne that she saw this ex-boyfriend and he had made quite the scene. Rachel never told Joanne the full story, though. Her friends and family also say that this relationship was volatile. Her mom described it as fire and ice. This boyfriend, Thomas, had become super upset when they broke up. Rightfully so, but it was to the extreme. Greg even recalls taking phone calls from Thomas where Thomas was crying to him about the breakup, even though they didn't know each other. Here's Greg in his own words. He sounded like a, 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 an emotionally impassionate person, like not in control of his emotions, if that makes sense. I mean, so he just was crying and like... The next time she came home post-breakup with Thomas was that winter break. Thomas ended up coming over one night around 3 a.m. Her mom threatened to call the sheriffs and ask him to leave. As she puts it, he just wouldn't leave. Two days before Rachel disappeared, the pair had also been seen at a house party arguing. Thomas was begging for Rachel back and she was refusing him. Thomas denies any and all involvement in Rachel's disappearance. Despite no real physical proof of any involvement, Thomas does remain a person of interest to the current sheriff, Robert Chody. Here he is talking about that with Crime Watch Daily. What about an ex-boyfriend? Was there an issue with an ex-boyfriend? That person that you're speaking of was certainly somebody that we were still interested in. And until we can check that box to take him off the suspect list or person of interest list, then he remains on that list. As the first anniversary of Rachel's disappearance loomed, authorities weren't any closer to finding her, to solving this mystery. The investigation is described as exhaustive, but it's really brought up very little evidence since the time it began. Her mom says, quote, there's really no telling how it came down after she passed that driveway. Her dad says in his interview for ID Channels Disappeared that the family never locked their front door either. So there really isn't much telling what happened, just like her mom said. The case became cold and officially inactive. As time went on, her parents split up. The stress of the case was managed very differently between the two. Her father became consumed by it, and her mother needed his comfort and space from the case to move on in her daily life. We say this a lot on The Murder Diaries. Everyone grieves differently. As Janet puts it, his and mine personal relationship just, it just wasn't there. To her father, having a missing loved one became like a second job. 
In his own words, he describes it as such. And continuing with psychologically, it's always there. You wake up to it every day. He ended up getting laid off from his nine to five and dedicated the rest of his life to EquiSearch. He became the spokesperson for the very nonprofit that had aided in the search for Rachel. In this position, he did things like travel to Aruba to aid in the search for a missing 18-year-old, Natalie Holloway, in 2005. On top of all of that, Robert was also the point person for the family when it came to media and anything else that brought awareness to Rachel's case. Two years after Rachel went missing in 2004, a new sheriff took office. Under his jurisdiction, interest in Rachel's case was revived. He built a Rachel Cook task force that included detectives, Texas Rangers, FBI, and the Austin Cold Case Unit. Unfortunately, there wasn't a lot uncovered through this task force. By 2006, the task force was disbanded and a new detective was appointed Rachel's case. The files on Rachel's case, according to Disappeared, take up six shelves and multiple filing cabinets in the detective's office. He has three daughters, and Rachel's case really hits home for him. Then in August 2006, a possible breakthrough came that seemed like it would be a home run. A prison inmate, Michael Moore, confessed to Rachel's murder. As the subject of an unrelated investigation, he said that he was also responsible for Rachel's disappearance. This is a guy that had spent most of his adult life behind bars. He was serving four life sentences for a 2003 robbery and murder of a young pregnant mom and her unborn when he made this confession. The crime took place in a town that neighbors Georgetown. He confesses that he was out driving his white pickup truck when he saw Rachel running. He stopped, got out, and attacked Rachel with a hammer. By all means, this seemed plausible. He was out of prison at the time of Rachel's disappearance, and he lived in the area. As Detective Larry Hawkins puts it, quote, he does have a history of murder. He has a history of a lot of things that can make him be a good suspect for this case. After Rachel disappeared, a white pickup truck was of interest to investigators, too, though nothing came of it. In fact, Janet recalls the first night Rachel went missing, a white pickup truck cruised slowly by their house. The fact that Michael drove a white pickup truck definitely added to the plausibility of his confession. So investigators questioned Michael at length. They took him to locations where he claimed Rachel's body was. Divers were deployed at Matagorda Bay, one of the claimed locations. Nothing turned up. Michael's attorneys worked out a plea deal. And the plea deal was this. If he pleaded guilty and helped investigators, then he would only get 18 months tacked onto his current four life sentences. On the day he was set to enter his plea officially, November 9th, 2006, the courtroom was packed. Friends and family of Rachel's, reporters, news personnel, all in attendance. When it came time for Michael to enter his plea, he says, not guilty. The courtroom fell to a hush. Even his own lawyers were shocked. He later told a reporter that he had made everything up, essentially taking back everything he had said. Robert's take is that Michael, ever the predator that his history shows he is, used his daughter's case for his own gain. Sheriff Chody explains further why Michael confessed and then denied in another portion of his interview for Crime Daily. Here he is in his own words put out in the media back then. I know that you ask one reason why he did it. He got a ride to the coast. He got to eat some cheeseburgers because he was sitting in a cell in Texas prison prior to that. So he got something out of the lie, if that's the case. Despite the change in pleas, the DA was still going for murder charges, but a grand jury was never called to order. After he had pleaded not guilty, investigators were no longer allowed to speak with Michael. He did sign some paperwork, but Detective Hawkins says it wasn't finalized by a judge and there was no evidence he did what he said he did. Because of this, there really wasn't a case for the DA. In 2011, Michael agreed to an interview for IDs disappeared about Rachel's case, the very episode used as a resource for our coverage today. But when he showed up, he said he had changed his mind. As Sheriff Chody says in that clip we just played, he does remain a person of interest. As a result, the search for answers continues. Georgetown Lake has been searched numerous times and investigators follow every lead. Many of these leads have led investigators to use ground-penetrating radar probes to detect disturbed soil or perhaps a body on a specific Williamson County property. Detective Hawkins says about the leads, quote, it's just a continuous story we hear with a little twist each time. It comes back to the same people every time. We're going to keep looking at it. It's a very large piece of property and we're hopeful. 
Rachel's dad unfortunately passed November 5th, 2014 at 59 from liver disease, which occurred from an undetermined cause. Robert's brother, David, recalls for the Austin American statesman, quote, he said more than once his goal in life was to see Rachel found and brought back home before he died. One of his wishes was that his funeral would be one last opportunity he would have to promote the awareness of missing persons, including Rachel. As for Janet, Rachel's mom, she says, quote, every day I think about her at least 100 to 1,000 times a day. I mean, she's part of me and I'm not going to give up. Here she is talking about Rachel in another interview. Rachel was a very good soul, and that hurts me because whoever took her took somebody that could make a huge contribution to this world. Rachel has been missing since January 10th, 2002. She was born May 10th, 1982, and would be 40 years old today. At the time of her disappearance, she was 5'2 and around 110 pounds. She is Caucasian with hazel eyes and darker blonde hair. She was wearing a gray sweatshirt green sports bra, and gray shorts. She wore this with white Asics tennis shoes and a yellow Walkman. Rachel has a tattoo of two heart-shaped cherries on her left shoulder. On her foot, she has a tattoo of a black star by her small toe. She has her belly button pierced as well as pierced ears. Foul play is suspected in her disappearance. Anyone with information can email coldcasetips at wilco.org or call the FBI at 1-800-CALL-FBI. Williamson County Sheriff's is offering a reward of $50,000 leading to her location, and her family has already offered an additional $50,000 reward as well. There are two sketches of persons of interest in Rachel's case that were recently redone and released in 2020. We will release both versions of the sketches for both persons of interest in our Instagram post. Until next time, be sure to follow us on our socials at The Murder Diaries Pod and check out our Patreon for more Murder Diaries content. And don't forget, stay safe. Bye. Seeking the truth never gets old. Introducing June's Journey, the free-to-play mobile game that will immerse you in a thrilling murder mystery. Join June Parker as she uncovers hidden objects and clues to solve her sister's death in a beautifully illustrated world set in the roaring 20s. With new chapters added every week, the excitement never ends. Download June's Journey now on your Android or iOS device or play on PC through Facebook games.